Welcome back to another episode of Optimal Anesthesia, where we take the complex world of anesthesia and make it as clear and digestible as a cup of morning coffee. Today, we will talk about a topic crucial for anyone managing airways and ventilation, understanding the lung zones under anesthesia. You might be thinking, lung physiology again? But stay with me, we'll make it practical for your next door case. Picture the lungs as a four-story building, where each floor represents a lung zone with different air and blood flow. Just like a building, changes on one level affect the others. Zone 1 is like that exclusive rooftop lounge, lots of space, lots of air, but not a whole lot of blood flow. This is because the pressure in the alveoli, those tiny air sacs, is so high, it actually squishes the blood vessels, making it hard for blood to get through. This creates dead space, where we have ventilation but no gas exchange. Under normal circumstances, zone 1 isn't a big deal because it's quite small. But under anesthesia, especially with positive pressure ventilation, this rooftop lounge can suddenly expand, increasing dead space and reducing overall efficiency. Next, we have zone 2, the floor where things start getting exciting. Blood flow starts making its way through but is still at the mercy of pressures in the alveoli and the arteries. This is where you start getting a mix of ventilation and blood flow. The real gas exchange action is happening here. This is the zone where work gets done, lots of blood flow, efficient gas exchange, and everything working in harmony. This is the area we aim to optimize under anesthesia. But when anesthesia kicks in, this zone can start to shrink as more blood gets trapped in zone 1 and zone 2. Finally, there's zone 4, the creepy basement no one wants to visit. This only comes into play when things go wrong, like when the patient has edema or low lung volumes, making it harder for oxygen to transfer into the blood. Alright, now let's talk about how anesthesia shakes things up in this four-story building of ours. When we give anesthesia, it's like the building's electricity shuts down, muscles relax, and the structure sags. This leads to a drop in functional residual capacity, FRC, by about 15 to 20 percent in adults. So, imagine the lower floors getting flooded, collapsing some rooms, and reducing overall lung capacity. Not great, right? Here's what happens next. Zone 1 expands, the rooftop suddenly has more space, but it's mostly wasted because there's no gas exchange happening there. Zone 3 shrinks, our main workspace is reduced, which means less efficient oxygen transfer. Let's say you're the maintenance crew for this building. How do you keep things working smoothly? 1. Recruitment maneuvers, a good old-fashioned reset. Imagine hitting a reset button that reinflates the entire building. That's what recruitment maneuvers do, applying positive pressure to pop open the collapsed areas of the lung. Just be gentle, though, because if you overdo it, you might cause damage. 2. Peep, your best friend in keeping doors open positive and expiratory pressure acts like doorstops throughout the building. It keeps those doors, alveoli, from slamming shut every time you exhale. This helps prevent atelectasis and maintains gas exchange efficiency. Fun fact, studies show that individualized PEEP settings can shift more of the lung into zone 3, leading to better oxygenation. 3. Positioning, moving furniture around sometimes, simply changing the position of the patient is all it takes to optimize those lung zones. Ever noticed how oxygenation improves when you turn a patient prone? It's because gravity helps distribute blood flow more evenly, pushing more of the lung into zone 3. According to the book Basic Physiology for Anesthetists by Hemmings and Egan, patient positioning plays a significant role in redistributing blood flow across lung zones. And that's a wrap for today's episode of Optimal Anesthesia. If you found this chat about lung zones helpful, or if you have any tips or experiences of your own, share them with us. And remember, you can find more in-depth resources and the latest evidence on OptimalAnesthesia.com. Until next time, stay curious, keep your patients breathing easy, 
and never stop learning.